How to do something science? We're looking at infectious diseases. So the science understanding we're going to look at is that uh, infectious disease differs from other diseases and we're going to distinguish between infectious and non-infectious diseases. Then we're going to talk about some of the pathogens. So a disease is when uh, an organism isn't working correctly. So they're in an abnormal state and they're not doing their normal functions well. And we can break up diseases into two groups, infectious or non-infectious. So infectious diseases are, occur when you get infected with a pathogen and that causes the disease. Um, so a pathogen is a disease-causing organism. And we're going to look at some different types of that today. Non-infectious diseases aren't caused by pathogens. They can't be passed on from one person to another. So like I just said, non-infectious diseases can't be transmitted between people. So some examples are heart disease, most cancers, diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. They can't be transferred easily from one person to another and they're not transmitted by an um, organism. So because of that, they're non-infectious. You can't infect someone uh, with diabetes, for example. So the causes of non-infectious diseases can be lifestyle factors, genetics and mutations. Um, some examples of this, well, let's look at diabetes. There's two types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is caused by uh, genetics. Um, you inherit that. Type 2 diabetes is caused usually by lifestyle factors. This is where by not doing exercise, not eating um, healthy foods, uh, you can develop an intolerance to insulin or you just don't produce enough insulin. Non-infectious diseases you can't catch from one person to another. Infectious diseases are caused by the transmission of pathogens. So a pathogen is something like a virus, bacterium, fungal, uh, fungi, protist, or a parasite. So I've got some pictures of those here. So here I have, a, this is called a bacteriophage, this white thing down here. That's a virus that acts on only bacteria. It's this big green thing behind it, that's a bacterium. Here we have an ant that's been infected with a fungus. Um, that fungus causes the ant to climb high on a tree grab on with its jaws really strongly, then the ant dies, then two fruiting bodies pop out and then they, these release the spores for that fungus. And we haven't found any fungi, uh, fungi that does this with humans, which is quite good. Here we have an animal parasite. This is an isopod that replaces the tongue in certain species of fish. So it floats around in the ocean when it's small, goes into a fish's mouth, grabs onto the tongue, uh, slightly eats away at the tongue while taking in food in, from the ocean um, into its mouth. And the fish normally doesn't even notice this happening, which is kind of interesting. Pathogens can be exchanged in a variety of ways, and we're going to look at this um, in another video later. So we're going to start by looking at viruses. So viruses are small packets of protein called capsids. Inside that capsid you have um, some genetic information, either in the form of DNA or RNA. So down here I have a picture. Over here we have a bacteriophage again. So it's called a T even phage. Um, the capsid is at the top here, and then we have all these other bits um, that are produced later on. But the capsid contains the, in this case, it's DNA. Here we have the influenza virus, and inside there it's got RNA instead. But again, it's encapsulated with this capsid. Um, sometimes the capsids have a uh, triglyceride layer on them, so if an oily or a fatty layer. Um, the outside can have, in this case, there's protein sticking out. These ones down here are proteins as well. But that's, there's a variety of shapes and many different shapes of virus. The way viruses work is that they infect a cell, they take it over and they tell the cell to make more viruses rather than doing their regular job. So over here we have an animation of a T even phage um, overtaking a bacteria and getting it to make some copies of itself. So we get uh, the bacteriophages, um, they dock with the outside of the cell, they inject their um, DNA or RNA into the cell, that hijacks the cell's workings to make more copies of the bits that make up the virus. The viruses make themselves, then the cell bursts and releases the viruses. Sometimes what happens is the viruses are just produced constantly and they emit from the cell without killing it. The reason why this is bad is because the cell isn't doing its regular job when it's making viruses. So you can get cells dying, which leads to tissues dying off, and if enough tissues die off, you can get organ failure, and if the organs don't work, then you die. But it depends on uh, what kind of cells the virus infects. Let's look at some examples. Um, this is a very famous uh, virus. This is the Ebola virus. And this is one of the first photos of the Ebola virus taken. Um, the Ebola virus causes Ebola hemorrhagic fever, which um, is not good. You get a fever, you start bleeding from every orifice in your body, 
and you infect other people by spraying infected blood around. Down here, this is another famous virus. This is HIV. And you can tell it's HIV because it has this specific shape in there, this kind of wedge shape inside the virus. Um, HIV leads to AIDS. So HIV viruses infect um, immune cells. They stop your immune cells from working, which stops your immune system from working. And uh, then you die normally of something um, fairly simple like a cold or a flu. But you can also die of some other ones, and we'll talk about one of those later on. Down here we have a flu virus, so these things budding out the side of the cell, they're flu viruses that are being produced by the cell, and then they're just being emitted slowly. So in this case, the cell isn't exploding and releasing the flu viruses, it's just producing them and then kicking them out. This last one, this is a rhinovirus. Uh, this causes the common cold. Now in the common cold, what's happening is uh, your immune system overreacts to the uh, cold virus infecting you. So the cold virus itself doesn't do too much. It's your immune system that causes all the symptoms that you get when you get a cold. So bacteria, they're single-cell prokaryotic organisms, and they can reproduce independently of an organism. Whereas the viruses, they need a cell of an organism to reproduce. The bacteria, they can reproduce as long as the um, conditions are good for them. So depending on the bacterial species, they might reproduce inside or outside of the cells. And the way bacteria cause illness is they can secrete um, toxic compounds that harm the host. And depending on what species, they might produce different compounds. So again, let's look at some examples of infectious bacteria. Um, this is our good friend E. coli. So this is common in everyone's gut. Um, if it's transferred from one person to another, though, it can cause food poisoning. It's one of the food poisoning bacteria, one of the many food poisoning bacteria. This is a streptococcus um, bacterium. Streptococcus can cause strep throat, which is where you get a painful throat infection. Um, down here, this one here is Bacillus anthracis. Uh, this is anthrax, so um, it's present in soils. Um, it can be quite deadly, um, and many countries tries to use, try to develop it as a weapon, um, so it produces a toxin that's not good for you. This one down here, this is Vibrio cholerae. Um, cholerae is present when you um, don't keep drinking water clean or you mix um, sewage with drinking water, cholera outbreaks can occur. Um, these can be quite devastating and they still, uh, outbreaks of cholera are still quite devastating in third world countries. This last one down here, this is tetanus. This is, uh, what's the name, Clostridium tetani. Um, tetanus, uh, the bacterium produces a toxin that stops your muscles from working. So tetanus' other name is lock jaw. So your jaw locks up because your muscles just tense essentially and they don't stop um, tensing. So you can't eat because you can't move your jaw and that means they have to knock out teeth to feed you. So we're going to look at some pathogenic fungi now. So fungi, they're eukaryotic organisms. They can be single-celled or multicellular depending on the species. And again, they reproduce independently of their host organisms. So they're not necessarily infecting cells. The way fungi work is they secrete substances that dissolve their environment and then they um, take in the compounds from the environment to help build themselves. When they infect um, organisms, they can weaken the immune system of the host they can also secrete chemicals that harm the host. This is a rust fungus. It's infecting a leaf. So this is infecting a plant. So we can see the spores being produced from the uh, fungus inside the plant. So here's some examples of some pathogenic fungi. Um, this is called ringworm. Even though it's not caused by a worm, it's caused by a fungus called dermatophyte. Um, so you get a fungal infection of the skin. The fungus is growing inside the skin, dissolving away compounds inside the skin and growing from there. Um, these are quite common and reasonably easily treatable. This picture here is showing the life cycle of a fungus called Cryptococcus neoformans. They misspelled it in the picture, which is kind of funny. The spores um, can be emitted from trees, but normally from the excretions of um, birds like pigeons. The fungus likes to grow there. So that produces the spores. The spores are inhaled. And they leap deep inside the lungs, and they can cause uh, damage to the lungs. Um, this isn't common in people whose immune systems are working fine, but people whose immune systems aren't, like people with um, HIV infections and AIDS, this can be quite deadly. So now we're going to look at protist pathogens. So protists are unicellular eukaryotic organisms, so there's a large group there, and they reproduce independently of the host organism. They don't need to go inside cells. Um, the way that they cause damage is they can damage the host cells and um, the symptoms of the infection can lead to the body overreacting, and the overreacting of the immune system can kill the host too. Here's some examples on the page. So here we have Giardia. Um, this infects drinking water, or just water. Then when you drink it, it gets into your body and it can cause you hassles, uh, mainly diarrhea and vomiting. And this can be quite dangerous. Sydney a few years ago had some problems with Giardia getting into their uh, water supply, so they recommended that people were boiling their water, because that's a nice way to get rid of it.
So here's some other protist examples. Here's um, Giardia again. This one down here is called Toxoplasma gondii. Um, this is carried by cats. Um, it's a protist. It affects the behavior of mice and rats. It makes them less scared of cats, which makes them easier to be um, eaten by cats. But they don't, uh, the Toxoplasma gondii, it can infect pretty much any warm blooded animal. Um, so many humans who have cats have infections with Toxoplasma gondii. And there are some theories that this might cause change to behavior if you get infected with it. Um, something like 40 to 50% of the population are infected with Toxoplasma gondii. Down here in the corner, we have probably one of the most dangerous protists. Um, these guys down here, these cause malaria. So what happens with malaria is a mosquito that's infected with uh, these plasmodium, so plasmodium falciparum, that's what that one stands for, that's what the P is. The mosquito carries it in its saliva. When it um, injects its proboscis into a person to um, suck up their blood, um, it transfers some saliva when it does that, and that saliva is carrying the um, malarial parasites. Malarial parasites infect red blood cells and they stop the red blood cells from working. Um, your immune system responds by giving you big fevers and um, if the fever isn't controlled uh, and the infection isn't controlled, you can die from malaria. It's estimated that about half of all people who have ever lived have died because of mosquitoes and mosquito-borne illnesses, um, including malaria. It still kills between half and one million people a year. The last uh, pathogens we're going to look at are parasites. Now, all of the ones we've looked at before are parasites, but specifically when we're looking at this area of biology, we're saying they're large multicellular organisms that usually you can see with the naked eye. It doesn't really cover everything, but normally we're looking at animals in this case. So again, they re can reproduce independently of the host organism, and usually they reproduce inside the host organism, although sometimes they do it outside once they've matured inside. Um, the way that they cause damage is that they can damage cells, tissues, and organs by reproducing inside those. Um, but they can also block movement of materials, and also do, while they're doing that, they can absorb, well, while they're living inside you or on you, they are absorbing your nutrients. So we had some worms before. This is a, uh, the mouth of one of the intestinal worms that I just had on the previous page. So what they do is get infected with the cyst, which is a small egg-like uh, structure. Once that gets into your um, intestines, um, the cyst hatches essentially and grows a big, uh, well, grows a worm, the worms add segments, and while it's in your digestive system, it's just absorbing nutrients while you're there. This one here is called a guinea worm. Um, in the 1980s, about three and a half million people would be infected with guinea worm a year. Um, you get infected by um, taking in contaminated water, usually by drinking it. Um, the worm goes inside your body, makes its way down to your legs or feet, sometimes arms and even sometimes your head, and um, it causes a big painful blister um, that gives you a burning sensation. So what you do to try to get rid of that burning sensation is dunking it in water and by dunking it in water you allow the worm's uh, eggs to come out into the water which again can infect other people. Um, the good news is this might be a disease that we can get rid of. It only infects humans and if you can do enough to stop it getting into the water supply you can stop it. So like I said in the mid 80s uh, there would be about three and a half million cases of guinea worm a year uh, last year, there were about 26 in total across everyone on the planet. So we might be able to uh, get rid of guinea worm. Down here, we have an example of someone who's been infected with a filarial worm. So these are worms that block up uh, lymph nodes. So lymph is a fluid that flows around your body that's important in the immune system. The worms get into the lymph nodes and stop the lymph from flowing back to where it should. So the lymph can come into an area, but it can't flow back out. And that causes this painful swelling called elephantiasis. And this last one is kind of scary. Um, this is called Demodex. So here's an adult Demodex here. 100% um, of people who were tested are infected with this guy. Um, he lives on your face. He likes to live inside the eyelash, uh, the root of the eyelashes. So here's an eyelash hair, and here are some Demodex eggs that have been hatched there. Now, as far as we can tell, it's not particularly harmful. But what's interesting about Demodex is they're crawling all over your face. And they don't have an anus. So whilst they eat skin and um, oils and so on on your skin, they just kind of grow longer until they die and then they explode. Um, we're not sure if this causes any health issues. There are some theories that increased numbers of these in some people might cause um, issues like rosacea, which is a skin disorder. So today on Flipping Science, we looked at the difference between infectious and non-infectious disease and looked at some examples of pathogens. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya.